In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Thank you so much, O Lord, for always pursuing us, always um, warning us, always bringing um, to our attention that we are, when we are heading in the wrong way, thank you, Lord, for never giving up on us, always trying to pursue us and to save us and to bring us back to you. Save us, O Lord, from ourselves, first and foremost. Help us, O Lord, to have soft, attentive hearts and attentive ears to you. Be with us, O Lord, tonight in this Bible study and give us, each one of us, what we need to hear. Please hear our soothing intercessions that may annoy saints of mind. So please, you from the beginning through the mighty power of your love giving cross, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for them is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So we are... Uh... Kind of resuming with uh, Hosea, we're in chapter one. Uh, last time we covered the introduction and uh, uh, just a few verses. I want to cover some of the highlights that we've covered last time, and then we'll continue. And again, I want to remind you or any if, if there are any new um, folks with us here uh, to just jump in if you have any questions or comments or anything. Uh, first of all, we saw that there's like a direct... Uh, connection or strong connection, a direct correlation between love and knowledge. Um, if I don't love God, and if I don't grow in my love for God, I will not know God. And if I don't know God, and if I don't grow in my knowledge of God, I will not love God. Um, if you make, this is a little off, but if you make knowing God, knowing more of God, you're like number one top life priority. Halas, the rest is history. Everything else that you want and everything else that you hope for will follow. As far as, you know, growing in wisdom or, or in love or in forgiveness or repentance or whatever. It's all about growing in knowing God more. Um, said the message for us who are believers, who love God to a certain extent, that is um, different, actually, to for each one of us who loves God. If you don't increase in your knowledge of God, your love will, for God will not grow. And if your love for God does not grow, your knowledge of him will also not grow. As our Lord Jesus Christ said um, in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life that they may... What? What is eternal life? What did Jesus say? Eternal life. That they may know you. Know you. They may know you. That intimate knowledge, you know, know you. Okay. Also, we said that um, the, the book of, of Hosea is similar in tone to the book of Isaiah. If you recall how it's, it's not um, so harsh that one would lose hope. Uh, and it's not so gentle that one would lose respect, which is actually a nice clue for how we ought to be with one another. And we'll see God going back and forth, uh, even tonight too. Um, and we said that the, the short words, this wasn't in the introduction, the short words of Hosea were not merely words from God, but they were like teardrops from God over his bride, Israel. Yani, this book really opens a window to us into God's heart. Like God is kind of venting in this book, if you will. Really makes you kind of, I don't know, it's, it's, this is blasphemous, but to, like, to feel bad for God, to like really see what he has to endure because of us. As he is the bridegroom who truly loves his bride, and now his love keeps being reciprocated with rejection and infidelity and and, and just insults and hurts. <clears throat> you really feel bad for God in this book. Now, in, in the first um, 
think we covered only the first four verses, verses uh, along with the introduction. Um, and a couple of points from that, we said that the, the completion of failure or the epitome of failure is to falter or limp between the two opinions or the two sides, to be lukewarm, to go eat the cake of God's side and then go eat the cake of the devil's side or the world's side, then limp back to God's side, then limp back to again to the world's side. I'm, I'm saying cake because the, the word... Um, the blame, which is uh, mm -hmm. where is it? Oh, yeah, there, there, verse three. <clears throat> because we said like that's a kind of a pressed cake, like that with two halves, and it's it's talking about going to this side and then this side. They can bite from here, bite from here. As some people say erroneously, al albak, rabbak, which is a very wrong. Uh, thing to say, an hour for your God and an hour for your heart, as if they're on opposite sides. Um, and then we said that to keep limping between those two ways, to keep the blame will only give birth to the epitome of failure or the completion of failure, which is also called Gomer. That's That's the meaning of Gomer. <clears throat> and then we said, by the way, the person who is Gomer de Blaim, means limping between the two lifestyles and the epitome of sin, will live a scattered life, tossed to and fro like a leaf on a wave, or a boat without an anchor in a stormy sea. A person who's jumping from one thing to another, to another, to another, and cannot find rest anywhere. Where do we get this? That they will be scattered from Yisrael, Jezreel. God will scatter <clears throat> like a farmer scatter seeds. All right. And that's what we covered last time. Comments, questions, uh, anything before we move on? I when I said Gomer means failure. Uh, the epitome of failure or the completion. Kamel el fashal. Yani the completion of failure. Or the epit, yani, failure, uh, the perfection of failure, if you will. If you can say that. Okay. Are uh, you what? Lukewarm, that implies uh, hypocrisy, right? Yes. And uh, cold is not good, only hot is good. That's true, of course. Hot is, is where we need to be. But God said, I wish you were either cold or hot. Why? Cold meaning if that if you are away from God or that you have if, if you are doing the wrong thing, that at least you know you are doing the wrong thing. At least you know and you're acknowledging that you are far from God. Why? Because then yeah, hopefully you'll say, okay, I can't remain like this. I need to fix it. Knowing that you're cold will lead to you're heading towards the warmth. But being cold, but thinking that you're warm is what lukewarmness is, the, the hypocrisy. Um, so meaning, if it ain't broke, why fix it? So God wishes that we would acknowledge that we are broke. Or fix it and be hot. So, it, okay. of course, we don't want to be cold, but it is good. When a person is cold, it is good to be cold and to acknowledge that I'm cold because that's what's going to drive me to try to change something or to fix something. Yes, yes. And I need to know that he's the son of righteousness, Shams al -Bir, so the farther you go from the light or the sun, the colder you'll get. <clears throat> and, and, and it's kind of dangerous because of those who are lukewarm, meaning they are cold, but every once in a while they come close, get some warmth, and then go back to the cold, come back, some, get some heat and go back to the cold so they're lukewarm. They can't They can't get hot. If Yanni were using the analogy all the way. Um, okay, ready to move? Let's, um, we're going to read through verse 9 
but let's read from verse one, Tiani, so we can have it kid, uh, all together. So I need somebody to read from verse one through nine. Who will read? All right, um, Mary, huh? Maximus, okay, go ahead. The word, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Biri, in the days of Yuza, Josam, Haza, and Haskia, kings of Judea, Ju, Judah, Judaya, and in the days of Ju, Jerudum, Jerudam, the son of the Josh, king of Israel, when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of Haraltori and children of Hartolori, for the land has committed great Harlotri Harl uh, Harl by depart departing from the Lord. So he went and taught Gomer, the daughter of the Blyam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Gia, Giu, and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of the Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, call her name Lo Rahama. For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the on the house of Judah, will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, um, nor by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. Now when she had when mm -hmm. lo, when Loraham lo lo Rahama, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, "Call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God." Glory to the Holy Trinity, our God, forever and ever, Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. Last time we stopped in the middle of verse four, so we're going to continue uh, with verse four. Uh, said then the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. And, and we talked about Jezreel means God sows, Yezra'il, or God scatters, as in it has two meanings. God scatters, like as in scattering the seeds, and or God plants, as in gives roots. Um, but then continuing with, with the rest of uh, verse 4, it says a little, a little while, I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Ye Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. What is this? Who is Jehu? And what's the deal with the bloodshed of Jezreel? Uh, as you all know, there was at one point a very evil king in Israel named Ahab or Ahab. Ahab, it's uh, in First Kings, and his wife was... Ten times worse than him. Her name was Jezebel. Horrible person. Um, and this is at the time of Elijah the prophet. And the capital of Israel back then was called Jezreel. Okay? Um, and we know the, the, the story when uh, Ahab or really Jezebel plotted. She just told Ahab to play along. Uh, against uh, Naboth of Jezreel, Naboth el Yazraeli from Jezreel, uh, in order to take his vineyard. Yani this this you know little guy who has a little vineyard in in you know uh, garden, if you will. And then King Ahab was walking around, even though he's a king and he has a ton of property. He saw it and he liked it, so he wanted it. And then he offered to buy it from Naboth, and Naboth said no. 
even though he offered him a ton of money. Why no? No, but because this is inheritance from God. What God gave us to me, to my ancestors, and I need to hold on to it and pass it on to my lineage, to my descendants. So Ahab was was all sad and upset and went home. And he was all pouting. And Jezebel told him, what's your deal? What's your problem? And he told them I wanted to buy the garden of the boot and he wouldn't sell to me. And she told him, okay, you... Uh, Go, go play Xbox with your friends and I'll take care of this. <laughs> so she plotted against Naboot and like long story short, uh, she paid a couple of hoodlums to accuse him of blasphemy and had him stoned to death and then gave the vineyard to Ahab. And Ahab didn't even ask her, oh, no way, how'd you get the vineyard? Like I couldn't even get him to budge or whatever. He said, yeah, yeah I got the vineyard. And he was all happy and and didn't even ask. And and. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and in the place where they, uh, this is, in, it had happened in Jezreel, in the capital of Israel, and they plotted against uh, Nebut in order to take his vineyard, and the Bible tells us that the dogs came and licked the blood of Nebut after they stoned him, after they killed him. And Elijah went to Ahab and told him that, the 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 dogs that licked the blood of Nabut will also lick your blood in the same place and will eat the flesh of Jezebel for this wicked evil that y'all did, that y'all have done in the sight of God. And then fast forward, and then there was a guy named Jehu. This is the one we're talking about here. He was a leader in the army of Israel, and he was very zealous for the evil that Ahab and Jezebel did and they were doing and he executed all of the lineage of Ahab and Jezebel <clears throat> and it gets a little graphic there because um, you know Ahab was killed and the dust came and licked his blood there but then Jezebel he said you know is there any righteous people here who are tired of this evil like and uh, eunuchs I think or people who are up in the in the palace or whatever pushed Jezebel from the balcony and she fell between the horses and they trampled her. And, and after that, they went and had dinner. <laughs> they just left her body. And by the time they came back, all that was left was her hands and her feet. Um, and I think her head too. I don't remember. A lot of some symbolism there, but now... Abu Najihu Damish Kan Malik Shroyahu Al Malik Al Kuayis uh, it was the commander of the army, oh. I think. Rafat? Abu Najihu Kan Malik, who was Malik al Wahid from Blue Israel, who was the name of the Lord. I'm sorry. Jehu was the, was the king of Israel, and it was the only king who of the northern kingdom. God named him by name. He asked, God told Elijah when he flee from Jezebel that why you are sad, go and anoint Jehu, a king of, over Israel. However, he was anointed at the time of Elisha. Elisha sent one of the sons of a prophet and anointed him. So he started off good, but turned bad after that. And yeah, and but when he when he had Jezebel killed, he, hmm. he wasn't the king yet, right? He, he was rebelling against the uh, king. Was that rebelling. was the coup. That was yes. the coup. Yeah, actually, we're going to talk about that too um, in, in a minute. Um, I was going to say, like, we might think that Jehu like did something good. So why on earth would God avenge the blood of Jezreel on the house of Jehu? Well, it's because Jehu was also bad, like Rafat said. And he did the same sin and same behavior of Ahab. Jehu was not jealous because he hates sin, but it's because he hated the sinners when he did this. <clears throat> and this is not what God wants. Otherwise, we will annihilate each other because we are all sinners. Um, one, one, one of the horrible things he, he did uh, that he ordered uh, the city where the sons of Ahab were hiding, 70 of them. He ordered them to be beheaded. So they beheaded 70 of the sons of uh, Ahab okay. uh, upon his command. This is a blood that is uh, 
blood of Israel that is referred to here. Exactly. In addition to the symbolic meaning. Yes. Um, one thing we get that's just this long story. It's just to just explain what is this, you know, eventually in the bloodshed of Israel in the house of Jehu. Uh, but just from the, yeah, we need to, as far as we're concerned in our everyday life right now, we need to be very careful that we only hate the sin because it is wrong to hate the sinners, no matter who the sinners are or what they have done. We are, if we are to hate anything, we are to hate the sin, but to love the sinner. Be careful of this because some of us inadvertently or unintentionally, whatever, hate the sinners. And our children and our churches hear or feel or see the hatred that we have towards the sinners and they grow up thinking that we hate other people. I'm gonna, because I'm, they are sinners. Yes. I'm, I'm confused now. So Jehu didn't call the sons of Israel. Israel. He call, he killed the sons of Ahab. Ahab. Right? And it was in at the village of Jezreel. Right? Mm -hmm. So Jezreel here is not a physical person. Uh uh the bloodshed of Jezreel, meaning the bloodshed that happened in the city of Jezreel, which okay. is the capital of Israel. Okay. That's what I want to understand. Yeah. Verse 5. Thank you. So sure. It says, it shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Israel. The bow as in like the bow and bow and arrow. Uh, bow is a symbol of strength. So when God says, I will break the bow of Israel, he's saying, I will break their strength. I will put an end to their strength. And halas, once you break a bow, it's, you can't fix it. You can't repair it. It's like not, not really usable. And he will do it in the same place in Israel. So that's why he says here, I will break their bow, the bow of Israel, in the valley of Israel, in the same place. Verse 6, And then she, Gomer, conceived again and bore a daughter. And what was the first, what was the name of the first child? Jezreel. Jezreel, Jezreel, Abuna. No, no, no. The, uh... Oh, yes, yes. Sorry. And then now the second one is a daughter. And God said to him, call her name Lorohama. For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. The first son was named God will scatter. The second child is a daughter and her name is called Lorohama, meaning no mercy. No mercy. No mercy. Uh, or I will not have mercy on Israel. And indeed, this is exactly what happened after the war with Assyria. Israel was annihilated and the remnant were scattered all over the world. Now verse 7 is very interesting. <clears throat> it says a yet I will yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow nor by the sword or battle or by horses or horsemen. Now, God is talking here about Israel and the destruction that will come upon Israel. Why is God doing that? Is he taunting Israel or rubbing it in? What do you think? Because all the kings were very bad, and each one kills the one before him, and he became a king, and so on. None mm -hmm. of them were good. But the kings of Judah were, uh, most of them were good, or eight of them were good. Okay, so why is, you're right, so why is, why is God bringing the kings of Judah right now? This whole thing, he's talking to Israel. But when somebody, he said, uh, hmm? no, he said the house of Judah. Seven. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah, not Israel. Yes, yes, but the whole letter, the whole prophecy of Hosea is for the house of Israel. So why is God now talking about the house of Judah and that He will have mercy on them? Because. 
The reason is Ma yeah. means here that from house of Judah will come the Savior, Messiah, Jesus Christ. Sure. Yes. That that is a true fact. But why is God while talking to Israel and he's threatening them? And he's telling them, I'm not going to have mercy on you, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah. Is he like telling them, I, I have favoritism? Like, I don't like you? No. The reason he's doing this is, lest anybody think, like, what's with this cruel God who annihilates his people and scatters them all over the world? So God speaks into that and shows that if he were a cruel and merciless God, he would have annihilated all people. But the simple fact is that he will have mercy on Judah and will save them by himself. This tells us right away what? That God is not a cruel God. He's not just somebody sitting there trying to destroy people or, or, or waiting to spank people, or to punish people or whatever. God is not a cruel God. And that he tailors the consequences to each one according to their deeds. We need to remember this because a lot of people struggle with why did God allow you know the annihilation of all these people and all these countries and all what's funny is is not funny, but what's interesting is that people are really bothered when um God annihilates and scatters other nations from before the house of Israel. But then nobody says, why did God annihilate the house of Israel? here and scatter them all over the world and, and punish them or whatever. Why? Because here God's yeah, he states very clearly why he's doing this. He gave them so many warnings. But with the other nations that God annihilated or asked them or told them to like to destroy them all, it's because these people were not just innocent, you know, people. Like they were horrible people. They used to have children just to offer them in, in fire alive to their gods and idols. They lived uh, very bad lives. And God told his people, if if you keep behaving like them and you don't repent and you don't do this, I will do to you what I did to them. <clears throat> That's why God uh, is having mercy on Judah, but not on Israel. God, he tailors, and if we're reading the Old Testament, we'll see God is sometimes very kind and very merciful and very gentle and very loving and all that stuff. And sometimes we see the wrath of God. This right away tells us it's not is that because God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So therefore, why is why is his action changing with different people? Is because these people are different. Because these people are choosing to live a certain way. And we read this in uh, we read this in Isaiah uh, thirty seven through thirty nine, uh, in chapters thirty seven through thirty nine at the time of the king of Judah was uh, the king of Judah at that time was King Hezekiah. And he was a good king, and he walked with God. And when Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came and attacked Judah, King Hezekiah prayed to God, and he lifted up to God the letter from Sennacherib, all the threats and the insults and stuff with you know all of that. And indeed, God saved them, and he sent his angel, and he killed the whole army of the Assyrians by himself, not by bow, or, or arrow, or, or horse, or horseman, or whatever. By himself, he sent an angel. We don't even know his name, just a little angel, and killed 185,000 strong. And the southern kingdom of Judah remained for another 133 years after the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. And the only variables here is the behaviors and the lifestyle of the kingdom of Israel, the behavior and the lifestyle of the kingdom of Judah. <clears throat> and then Hosea and Gomer have their child, and it is another son. It's the verse 8 and 9. When she had weaned Lorohama, the daughter, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, Call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. So <laughs> Um, the children of uh, Jose and Gomer are a boy named God scatters, a girl named No Mercy, and a boy named Not My People. Uh, 
I doubt you'll find those in you know the books of like baby names when people are thinking uh, what to name their babies. I'm sure they were not popular at school. <laughs> That's true. Um, now, if you recall last time in verse 2, God told Hosea, go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. Harlotry. These three are children of harlotry, meaning... Uh, this is what I read in, in my research here, is that Gomer would remain unfaithful. And after Hosea took her as a wife, she went out and committed adultery on him. And she conceived these children of, a, of harlotry. You know that these are not the, the blood children of Hosea which I didn't actually know this before. When Hosea took Gomer... They are not Hosea's son? All the, the three the three kids? That's what, I, that's what I understood. Because that's why God calls them children of harlotry, as opposed to they are not children of, of marriage, of the union of Hosea and um, Gomer. Which I didn't... I didn't I didn't know this, but that's what I came across. And it kind of makes sense as to why God calls them children of harlotry. So when Hosea took Gomer, who does not deserve him as a wife, and she went and gave herself to others, she conceived and bore Jezreel, Rorohama, and Loami. Likewise, when God chose to be our bridegroom and took us for his bride, even though we don't deserve him, if we go and give ourselves to another, we will end up bearing the fruit of our sin and we will be scattered in our relationships and in our hearts and in our life and we will not receive mercy and we will not be his people. As in, you are not my people. As in, away from me, I do not know you. So, if we remain faithful to God, we will not bear children of holotry. We will bear good fruit. We will bear children, uh, uh, holy children, or righteous children. Which is like the fruit of the spirit. Like the fruit, if you think, is like the bearing or the children of the tree. Which is the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. But if if... If we give ourselves to another and we cheat on God, so to speak, we will have we will also bear fruit, but it's gonna be no mercy, not my people, being scattered, depression, anxiety, frustration, feeling empty, <clears throat> etc. Um comments or questions or anything or ready to move forward. Okay. Um, let's read verses uh, just 10 and 11. I will read, Abuna. Thank you. Go ahead, man. Yet the number of children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Glory to the Holy Trinity of God. Thank you. <laughs> God is amazing. Look at this. So, you will not be my people, and I will not be your God. Yet, yet is like but, right? B U T. So, so if if somebody tells you A B C, and then he says but X Y Z, that means what? He's negating the A B C. Yet, 
you should highlight that word, yet. Remember in the introduction how we said we will see the style like we did in, in Isaiah. God, God will chastise and then will give hope. Um, God will threaten and warn and then he will encourage and motivate. So whenever you come across one of those yet, right away think of after the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So after saying all what he said, then verse 10 he says, a, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. Not only will they get the gift of immense increase in number and blessings, but even way more importantly, that's like as far as the sand of the sea and the seashore and stuff. More importantly, they will get the awesome gift of being called the children of the living God. And this is exactly what um, we read uh, every morning in, in the Gospel of St. John, in John 1, verses 12 and 13. We said, what? Well, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. They were born of God. There's something important to note here. <clears throat> Israel, according to the flesh, are decreasing and dissipating. While Israel, according to the spirit, are fortified and increasing. So Israel according to the flesh, we know, the northern kingdom. So who is Israel according to the spirit? The Christians, the new church. The church, yeah. yeah, the church. She will remain and the gates of Hades will not prevail against her. Mm -hmm. And she will increase. As we read in Revelation, you know, millions upon millions and billions upon billions. Um, there is a nice contemplation I came across about the sand and the sand of the seashore. So yes, we all know like one meaning Yani, right away we understand is is that the increase in number, like one cannot even count the sand of the seashore. But there's another Yani important function for sand. Can you guess what it is? The I'm sand have a of, uh, oh, go ahead, Michael. I was, I was thinking of Genesis when the land holds the water back. Yes, bro. That's exactly it. The sand stops or keeps the waves of the sea at bay. Away from the land. And the sea always is a symbol of like perdition. And likewise, the children of the church, the new spiritual church, the new Israel, are to keep perdition and spiritual destruction away from the world. So we are the sand of the seashore, not just a number, but we have a function, we have a responsibility. We are to keep the waves of the sea and destruction away from the world. This is exactly what the Lord told Abraham when he was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, for the sake of 50 righteous, I will not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Unfortunately, Sodom and Gomorrah were out of sand. <laughs> you will. A grain of sand, when you look at one single grain of sand, it is small, it is weak, it is worthless, and it goes unnoticed. But when united together with many other grains of sand in one accord, together, then they can block the waves of the sea or the waters of a flood as we see and sometimes in hurricanes and floods and stuff so likewise the children of god while individually we may be as weak or as insignificant as a grain of sand but when we are united together in one accord we can be an impenetrable burial 
against evil waves of the attacks of the world. You know that sand can stop a bullet? Not just the waves, yani, but only when united. Just single grains yeah, can be ground kida, to powder, yani, dissipate, disappear. So, remember you are sand. Individually, you toast. We need each other. We need to unite. And when we unite, man, there's no stopping us. Yani, what we can accomplish, yani, what God can accomplish for us is, is really amazing. Uh, verse 11 is very sweet. It says, then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together. Allah. There will be no more two kingdoms. They will be one big undivided kingdom made of the two, which are. So this is like, okay, the, the children of Judah are the Jews. And the children of Israel, the spiritual Israel, are the Gentiles. Right? The church, the heavenly Jerusalem, is going to be formed of Jews and Gentiles, basically from every nation, uh, from every tribe, from every people. And look at this. The children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head. And of course, who is that one head that will be their head at that time? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Yeah. By the way, note that these prophecies here um, did not take place except in the church. But the Jews are still waiting for the literal fruition of these prophecies. And they are waiting for the Messiah who will be their head. And you'll notice that uh, while Israel has a president. I'm talking about the nation, the country right now. While Israel has a president, I don't even know. Do we know who the president of Israel is? I'm sure somebody does, but Netanyahu. he's just a title, huh? Netanyahu. Yeah. No. no? See, that's actually you proved no, by point. He has the prime minister. So he's the, the, prime the minister. president of Israel is not. Is not. Is like, we don't even know his name. Like I don't. I don't. Maybe just my ignorance, but most people don't. He's just the title. The one who has the real power here in Israel is the prime minister. Minister. One thing that confused me, I know some of you came with us to on the trip to Jerusalem. Um, this is way off topic, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to understand a little bit about you know, what the you know Jewish people think or believe. Is that when we were in Israel, it seemed like they had pictures of messiahs i don't know what to call them like there were these these men these rabbis that one after the other you know for a period of time they would look at him as a messiah but not really the messiah does anybody remember that like in, in the main city in the streets and the posters and stuff what was that because i know that the tour guide explained it to us but i don't remember and i didn't understand it i remember exactly what you said <laughs> so i'm still i'm in symbol of but I, I remember the pictures and what she said. She, she said they considered him like a messiah, but I'm sure they didn't mean the messiah. The messiah, yeah. The messiahs, but small m, maybe. Okay, so uh, a point for themselves, one head. And they shall come up out of the land. The believers shall rise above the level of the earth, the level of the world. Whenever you see come up or rise or mountain or hill going up, so they will leave or rise above the level of the earth, above the level of the world that commits committed adultery on her bridegroom. Um, in Colossians 3.1, it says, Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on and keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So just come up out of the land, out of the earth. For great will be the day of Jezreel. For great will be the day of Yisrael. And then the first Jezreel, 
becomes the second Jezreel. Remember when we said Jezreel has two meanings? So the day of misery and captivity and scattering will be the day of glory and elation and planting, where God will plant them. As he said, Yazra'il, God will scatter or God will plant. And 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 yani, give roots. First Corinthians 3 9, it actually talks about this. It says, You are God's field. You are God's husbandry. Uh, husbandry in Arabic is um farming like fil filaha. Not filaha, filaha. Y'all can't hear Missy, but I can hear her on the other side of the house. So. Um, you are God's field. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. It's 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Also, Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. This is what our Lord um, quoted in Luke 4 when he was telling the world who he is and why he came. It says says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the openings of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. So, to comfort all who mourn. He's changing Jezreel for Jezreel. Right? One Jezreel to another, the opposite Jezreel. Those who mourn, he will comfort them. To console those who mourn in Zion. Again, one Jezreel for another Jezreel. To give them beauty for ashes. To give them one Jezreel for another Jezreel. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called oaks. That they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. I shall be your God, and you shall be my people. You get that? So like he's he's changing he's changing one Jezreel for one Jezreel. Why who are you and why did you came? The Lord has appointed me to take the people. From Jezreel to Jezreel. <laughs> From a state of Jezreel to a state of Jezreel. Hi, Mama. Yes. Uh, I don't understand very, very well from 7 up to 11. Can you please explain it more again? Because from what Israel were doing, then everything was upside down. I understand, but not very much. Um, okay. Uh, so God is warning the people of Israel. And in warning them, he's telling them, I'm, I'm not going to have mercy on you. You're not going to be my people. But in seven, he says, I'm going to have mercy on the people of Judah. So that the people with Israel would realize that, okay, God is not just this mean God or cruel God. He will be merciful to those who are obeying him and, and living with him and, and not merciful to those who are not. And then after that, Loami is the same thing. After mm -hmm. that, where it says yet, this is the part maybe that's confusing. So after God is giving them this warning, then he talks about um, the, the, the encouragement or the motivation or about what happens to people who return and walk with God again, how they will be united and how the, the church basically now, now he shifts talking about the future, the new church, which mm -hmm. is in verses 10 and 11. They will be unnumbered. There will be as many as the sand of the seashore and not only in number, but also in strength when united, they can stop if they choose to. And if they are united, if we're busy fighting each other, y'all, the world is toast. Uh, why is my hand raised? Who raised their hand? That's weird. Um, if um, what was I saying? Oh, uh, if if we are not 
يعني united the world is toast and and if we're busy fighting each other arguing with each other criticizing each other which unfortunately we see a lot the world is penetrating the the water is penetrating the waves are coming in into the world I've said this a million times before I think a big part of why the wickedness and the evil is increasing so blatantly and so in your face is because of our silence because we're not being united to block it out we're just busy fighting with each other uh, did somebody raise their hand yeah I think Mary had her hand raised yeah, oh, okay uh, might be a I, I I don't know how that I happened. I saw my own hand raised. That was weird. Another upgrade or another update. Uh, I'm Mary. What's up? No, I I didn't raise my hand. I don't know how that happened. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, you're good. So anyway, and 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 just going back to the whole before we leave this chapter, Yanni, going from wonders real to wonders real. By the way, that phrase. We're, uh, you know, talking about, you know, becoming the people of God. Sons of the living. Uh, is, is uh, you will read this all over, this declaration that I shall be your God and you shall be my people. And it's not redundant because God is our God, but a lot of times we don't make him our God. So we're choose to not be his people. But when he says, I shall be your God and you shall be my people, this declaration is spoken by God many times in, I looked it up in 11 different books in the Bible. In Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Ezekiel, Joel, Zechariah, Hebrews, and Revelation. That phrase, you can look it up being God's people and him being our God. God is the one who initiates the covenant. He's the one who maintains the covenant and he is the one who heals and supports and fortifies the covenant. And he is the one who fulfills the covenant. God is all in all. Man's job is to just <laughs> not mess things up, not break the covenant. All God wants is that relationship with us. All he wants is that relationship with us. And our entry into eternal relationship with God is what God causes. And our forbiddance from this eternal relationship with God is what we cause. And we should make our best effort not to cause. Yani. We're not going to get ourselves into heaven. All, yani, at best, we just need to let God get us into heaven. We need to let him do it. By cooperating with him, by, by listening to him, by trusting him. Okay. Um, <clears throat> before we move on to uh, chapter two, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? They shall come out of the land. This you mean when they go to heaven or? Uh, two things. Yani, two things. That and also uh, coming up out of the land. Yani, coming up from the earth. Yani, mm -hmm. Separating ourselves. Elevating ourselves from the world. Yes, I'm in the Okay. Yani in, in the literal sense and in the spiritual sense. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's go into chapter two. It's very neat. Abuna, sorry. Yes. Is the great day of Jezreel the end of the world? What verse is that? I'm going back to it. The last one. What is the great day of Jezreel? For great will be the day of Jezreel. Uh, yes. Okay. This is where, where, where God turns Jezreel to Jezreel. Yeah, is what we talked about uh, from... Uh, Isaiah 61, or what, what the Lord quoted in 
in Luke 4. Oh. That will be a great day. The judgment day. The judgment. Where God will scatter and plant at the same time. Thank you. All right, sure. So chapter two. I'm just gonna start real quick with verse the first the first verse. Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. This verse is um, pretty special because of yani, the, the changes of the word choices in it. First of all, notice that he didn't say, say to your brother and your sister, singular. He said, say to your brethren and to your sisters. So now he's addressing all, okay? First thing. Also, he changed not my people to my people. And he changed no mercy to mercy. No mercy is shown. Did you see that? He changed the, the uh, lo ami to ami and lo rohama to rohama. So again, as, as we discussed in the introduction, just like the book of Isaiah, God keeps going back and forth between rebuking and warning to encouraging and giving hope. Now, who are the people that get to be called my people and get to be called mercy shown? And what do they need to do in order to receive those lovely comforting titles that's what we're going to read right now so now i'm going to need somebody to read from uh, verse 2 uh, through 13 or from verse 1 through 13 hmm. i'll read it go ahead the father son the holy spirit say to your brethren my people and to your sisters mercy is shown Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy on her children, for they are the children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine, and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. She will chase her lovers. Or, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season, and will take back my wool and my linen given to her cover, given to cover her nakedness. And I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, These are my wages that my lovers have given me. So I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. I will punish her for the days of the bowels to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me she forgot, says the Lord. Glory to the Holy Trinity, our God, forever and ever. Thank you. Okay. So, remember we're talking about who are the people who will get to hear the words "You are my people" or "You are" uh, or "Mercy is shown"? The first thing we need to do in order to be called God's people who will receive His mercy 
is to verse two is to bring charges. It says what? Bring charges. Okay. Bring charges against whom? Ourselves. Yes. Exactly. It says bring charges against your mother. We're going to talk about the mother thing, but it's he, God is like saying, yeah, if you want to be my people and you want to receive my mercy, bring charges against yourself. Self-accountability, self-examination or self-confronting. Mahasbit nafs. First Corinthians eleven thirty one, um, we covered that book a couple of books ago. It says a for if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. If we bring charges against ourselves, he will not do that to us. Halas is done. Okay, how does our wise mother, the church, help us to bring charges against ourselves? How does our wise mother, the church, help us to bring charges against ourselves? Confess. Our yes. And confession. yes. Actually, by, by holding us firm to God's commandments and teachings and keeping the sacrament of repentance and confession. You see how the church is doing everything she can in order to help us, to help save us from from judgment and condemnation. Um, we can't talk enough about the importance of, of the sacrament of repentance and confession. Okay. Bring charges against your mother, Ada. Who is the mother here? Liter we know the, the literal meaning. And that's obvious, right? Is the it northern the physical mother? The northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, he's talking to the children of Israel. So bring charges against your mother, meaning against the north kingdom of Israel. And now to us, what is our mother? Since we're talking about bringing charges against ourselves. Don't tell me the church. <laughs> What does a mother do? What makes a mother a mother? She nurtures, nurses, cares for. Yeah, just from the don't don't overthink it. From the initial sense, giving birth. Giving birth. Now we can answer this like bring charges against your mother. Who's 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 our mother? We can answer this question actually from James one. Verses 14 to 15. I'm going to read it to you. It says, a, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So our mother here is referring to the origin of sin inside us, which is, according to James 1, a our carnal desires. So when he says bring charges against your mother, this means also self-examining or self-accountability, but not with our actions or our deeds or the actual sin. Sin is the child here, but who's the mother? The carnal thoughts and desires. Bring charges against this. This is what you need to focus on and this is what you need to Fight. This is what need to bring charges on. Focus on the origin. Focus on your thoughts. This is the battlefront where you do 90% of your spiritual warfare. You know, a lot of times we think, uh, you know, our war, like in our enemy and the devil and difficult people and temptations and sin and misharafi. It's all, he, this is the battlefront here. Okay, does God want us to only bring charges against ourselves or to judge and condemn ourselves and that's it? He just wants us to yani, beat ourselves down and feel bad? No. No, it takes no pleasure from this. 
So why does he want us to bring charges against ourselves? For what purpose? To become righteous and to go to heaven, to be his sons. Aywa. And if you think of the immediate step after bringing the charges against himself, it's actually still in verse 2. It says, hey, this, is, this is what he wants. This is his purpose. This is what his goal is. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. I said this before. Some people, some people feel good because they felt bad. I brought charge against myself. I felt bad. I even cried tears and, and I confessed it to God in the presence of Abuna. Yay, I'm done. What do you say to that? No, Habibi. Bringing the charge against yourself alone is not enough. It must lead to us making every effort with a sincere heart to put away the sin, to abandon the sin. That's why God didn't stop here. He said, bring charges against yourself or bring charges against your mother. Bring charges. No, he said, hey, and bring the charges. This is what he wants. And let her put away, separate from her sins. St. Paul tells us this in Hebrews 12, 4. He says, hey, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. What does he want us to like cut ourselves and bleed? La. He's talking about when, when you resist something to the point of bleeding, like with all your power, with all your strength. So, if we regularly judge ourselves and, it's not all, and work on our repentance and work out our own salvation, then God will not judge us and God will call us his people and God will have mercy on us. So be careful lest you feel good because you felt bad and then khalas. And the church fathers teach us when you walk out of confession, always walk out with an action plan towards one of those sins. Don't try to take on too much, but just you're going to be working against something. Sometimes people go to confession, say the list, and then walk out. And then they, there's no action. There's no plan on working on something. They come back to confession, say the same list pretty much, or add to it, and they walk out again. It's called the sacraments of repentance and confession, not just the sacrament of confession. Now, let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. This has an important message related to the to the mother thing. He's covering two types of sins here. Can you tell what they are? I'm not sure, but I, I guess the sin of the soul and the sin of the heart. Uh, those two would be considered the second half. What is the first one? I wonder, is it physically and spiritually? Okay, getting closer. Yes. So The sin of the soul and the sin of the body. The sin of what? The soul and the body. Yes. Very good. So he's covering two types of sin here. Let her put away her heartless from her sight, meaning to repent from the outward sin, the sin that is seen, and to put it away. And then, and her adulteries from between her breasts, meaning to repent from the hidden sins in the heart. You see, some of us, erroneously, some of us, Focus on repenting from the outward sin. We focus on to not yell or to not curse or to not um, gossip or to not judge or to not lust um, outwardly. 
but we allow it in our hearts. We allow it in our minds, which is a catastrophe. You know, sometimes we can say, and this is what leads to the lukewarm thing that Mr. Ramses was talking about, is that be careful lest you decide, okay, I'm, I hate this person. I'm going to focus on speaking nice to them and to be kind and polite to them and to smile at their face. And then you're happy with yourself. Okay, it's a step. Great. Thank God. That's la uh, Yani, don't stop there. This is dangerous. We need to not only put away the sins from before this, uh, our sight, but also the sins from be between our breasts, in our hearts. Because like in 1 Samuel 16, 7, God told Samuel, a, God does not see as man sees. Since man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And look at this. You can focus on the outward, but the inward may still be there. It may still be bad. Or you can focus on the inward, the ones in the heart and the mind, and you will find that what? For sure, the outward will follow. Yeah, and sometimes I can focus on like, uh, don't be angry, don't yell at this person. And I like, I remain calm like this, but inside my head, I'm, I'm exploding. No, be careful. He wants us to put away both from the sight and between our breasts. Verse three. Okay, good. We still have some time. He says, lest, well, uh, eh, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born. This means what? This means lest I remove my covering of her. Mm -hmm. It is important to remember that the first thing we always thank God for in the Thanksgiving prayer is that he has covered us. Let us give thanks to the benefits of merciful God for he has covered us. That now is satarana. God covers us with himself in baptism. We put on Christ. God covers us with his grace in our interactions. God covers us as in covers our flaws and our weaknesses and our sins and our iniquities. God is so gentle and merciful and gracious. He does not expose all our flaws and weaknesses and sins and ugliness in front of others. Why? In order, in order to give us grace in their eyes. In order to, to, to encourage us and to give us hope. We will not be able to bear it if we saw everyone's flaws and sins and iniquities. We're not going to be able to stand ourselves. We're not going to be able to stand anybody. Lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy on her children, for they are children of harlotry. Now, after some giving, giving some hope and encouragement and positive motivation, now God is back again to warning and negative motivation. Because he's trying to balance here between not taking away hope and not taking away fear. Um, I think I'm going to stop here um, because there's a lot to say about verse 5 and I don't want to break it uh, halfway in the middle. So we can stop here um, at verse 4 and then we will continue next song for verse 5. But as usual, before we part ways, I'd love to know if anybody has any comments or questions. And also, I would love to know if anybody... Maybe he's thinking about something or or something stood out to them. <clears throat> well, for me, I think like reading from 1 to 13 in the new chapter, I really got very dizzy and it was scary for me all around like reading. Um, 
yes, I, it, I don't know. I, I was like, it was fearful. I don't know. But then like, it's very strong and strong words and like, mm. but um, processing it till now, I don't know, but I, I think talking again about like knowing God, I don't know if I will explain myself or I'll be able to explain this, but I remember one time my father of confession told me, if you want to be humble, you don't have to do anything. You just need to know God, mm. who God is, and everything will follow. And I've been carrying that in my mind since then, trying like how, 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 you know? And what came to my mind right now is all of this after being scared, but also it was like, wow, it's like, it's part of, knowing the ability of God, all of this, you know, and what's mm -hmm. he able to, what he's able to do. Yeah. And he's like, um, I don't know, like mm -hmm. in English. Um, and in a way it humbled me mm -hmm. reading this part. So yeah. it was like a weird transition, but it was good. You reminded me, Norma, of a long time ago was because um, I noticed sometimes when I talk with people about the fear of God and um, and it was, yeah, it was the gospel says uh, in the same gospel it said, do not fear. And then it said, I will show you whom you should fear. <laughs> it said, mm -hmm. do not fear, but also fear saying, do not fear those who kill the body and then have nothing to do, but fear the one who after killing the body has all the power to throw in hell. And now if, you know, I will show you from your fear and, and I would talk with people and they would say like, I don't know, man, like I, I don't, I'm not afraid of God. I, I, I love God and, and I understand this and I appreciate this wonderful that a person is like, you know, feels that way towards God. But then I was talking about, okay, you can say like, it's exactly what you were talking about. Like, don't fear God himself, his person, his fatherhood, fear God's justice, feel God's impartiality feel god's um warnings and threats he's not just saying empty words if kaza 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 then so and so and so will happen like so fear that god's promises or threats um and look at history yani yes god keeps shining his sun and sending his rain early and latter rain upon the righteous and the wicked but then eventually the righteous and the wicked, like Judah and Israel. Uh, then he deals one way or another, and then a different way with the other. Also, I love that verse that where um where is that verse? You know, it's where, where St. Paul is saying, like, if you have been grafted in, if God did not spare the original branch, the original Jews, and because of their continuous refusal, he broke that branch off and cast it away, and you the Gentiles have been grafted in. You know, and 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 implanted, and so if he did not spare the original branch, he's gonna spare you, if you if you remain stubborn and and, and not listen to him. That be careful. So that's that's something we ought to fear. In Romans, yeah, thank you. And there is sometimes people talk about the fear of God is simply to take God seriously. That's what that means. It's not to be afraid or terrified of God. He's your father, but just to take him seriously. And those who, I hope this doesn't confuse anybody, those who fear God will not have to fear God. You know what I'm saying? Those who take God seriously will not have to one day be afraid of God and tell him the rocks fall on us, cover us, hide us. Okay. Um, thank you. Good point. Anyone else? Comments, questions, anything that stood out? Okay. I don't really I know what else can cut good to, to, to tell us like how, Yanni, there is a way to have the peace and joy and fulfillment and satiation and and, and safety and all the stuff that we want so badly. And there is a way to get the exact opposite. Yeah, and he's making it very clear to us. Then the rest is up to us. 
Um, okay, God willing, we will resume uh, next uh, Wednesday uh, with from uh, chapter 2, verse 5. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear Heavenly God, um, thank you so much, Rabbi, because you, you don't get tired of pursuing us. You don't get tired of doing anything you can and everything you can in order to save us, whether it be calling us, yelling at us, threatening us, warning us, spanking us, or encouraging us, motivating us, and extending your arm to us. Lord, help us to respond to you one way or another. Help us, Lord, to be smart and to respond to you the, the easy way so that we don't, we're not forced to respond to you the hard way. Uh, most of all, Lord, um, we beg you and we thank you for never giving up on us until our last breath, oh Lord. Keep seeking us and keep talking to us and keep doing whatever it is that you see fit to get us to respond to you, to get our attention in order to save us so that we can be with you in heaven for eternity and may continue for eternity to know you more and more. Help us a lot to start this journey from now while we're here on earth to know you more. We ask you to please hear us through the intercessions that may and all you seen some others who please in front of me and through the mighty powerful love given cross. Please, O oh Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thou is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is on me, God, Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion, the gift of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you. Thank you. See you Thank all you. next time. Chapter 2, verse 5. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.